Welcome to the Brigham Young Becomes Rich video. Okay, on the first slide here, we have the last official residence of Brigham Young in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, this house here is called the Amelia Palace. That was uh, Brigham Young's favorite plural wife. He built this house for her and, and I guess for him uh, to live in. I think this was shortly before he died. Uh, it's also called the Gardo House, and at the time of its completion, it was worth $100,000. So what, 1876, I guess it was worth $100,000, which would be $2.7 million in 2020. So uh, pretty nice palace for one of his wives. And here's another picture uh, of the Amelia Palace or the Gardo House. And Brigham Young also had a winter house. Uh, this house was down in St. George, Utah, because, uh, of course, the weather's a lot warmer down there uh, in the winter. So, yeah, this is a picture of his St. George house. Uh, not too shabby, but it's uh, fairly large. And here's a picture of the Salt Lake Theater, uh, which was also owned by Brigham Young. I guess they, they had plays, musicals. I'm not sure what else they had in there. But uh, this Salt Lake Theater and the land surrounding it was worth about $125,000 in Brigham Young's time, uh, which would be $3.3 million uh, today in 2020. And uh, yes, Brigham Young did own this uh, building as well. Okay, we have a statement here by Brigham Young. He said, uh, God heaps property upon me, and I am in duty bound to take care of it. So... That's good, good when God heaps property upon you. Okay, a statement here by Fitz H. Ludlow. He's pictured above in, in his book, The Heart of the Continent. He says, Brigham Young is undoubtedly the richest man in the Western Hemisphere. So not, not sure if that is true, but indeed Br Brigham Young was very rich, as we're going to see on many of these different slides. It is not clear how rich he was. There's a lot of different conflicting information. We're going to present most of it in this video. Uh, one of the key parts in this video is going to list all of the businesses and enterprises that Brigham Young wasn't involved in, in during his lifetime. Uh, that can be found in D. Michael Quinn's book, uh, The Wealth and Power, uh, Mormon Hierarchy. Uh, We'll get to those slides, but just as a little uh, precursor, Brigham Young was involved managerially in at least 137 businesses in the Utah Territory, and I will list all of those uh, later on. Okay, a statement by Samuel Bowles, 1869. Brigham Young is at the head of everything. There is immense wealth in his possession. And even the Mormon writer uh, Ronald K. Esplin admits this uh, in his book, The Emergence of Brigham Young and the Twelve to Mormon Leadership, which came out in 2006. Uh, he's been working on the Joseph Smith Papers quite a bit as well. Uh, Esplin says, In Utah, Brigham Young controlled large resources and was known as a man of wealth. He enjoyed fine things. Uh, another little interesting statement by Brigham Young uh, in 1860 in General Conference. He says, I am not to be called in question as to what I do with my funds. He didn't want anybody looking uh, over him <laughs> or auditing him. He wanted, he wanted complete control of his funds and basically all of the funds of the church, all of the tithing money. All right, there was actually a hymn about Brigham Young being a king. This is kind of an interesting hymn. Uh, William Willis and other composers, The Mountain Warbler, 1872. Hail to Brigham Young, hail to Brigham Young, praise him every tongue and sing God bless our prophet, priest, and king, our leader Brigham Young. And in the history of the church, Brigham Young even said that he expected the church to support him and provide a living for him. Uh, so this is a statement by the prophet Brigham Young, History of the Church, Volume 7. I want my support and living by the church hereafter. 
so that I so that I can give my whole time to the business of the church, which he did not do because <laughs> he was managerial invo involved in 137 different corporations or enterprises. Okay, a statement by the Apostle John A. Widstow, General Conference, 1925. Some so-called historians who have written about us have laid as the foundation of their writings the assumption that Brigham Young became a Mormon because he loved wealth and power. Well, that may not be why he became a Mormon, but after he became the prophet uh, and leader of the church and the governor of Utah, he sure did enjoy all of his wealth and power, and he had a lot of it. Okay, a statement by Brigham Young's plural wife, Emily Dow Partridge. This comes from her journal uh, in 1874. Uh, she said that she was married to the richest man in the territory and that he provided sumptuously for some of his family. So he, he had certain favorite wives and certain, and I guess their children would, be, would also be favorites, uh, that he provided for sumptuously more than other wives and children. And of course, Emily Dow Partridge is pictured above uh, with two of her children. Okay, a statement by the prophet Brigham Young here in 1851. This can be found in Hubert Howe Bancroft's uh, History of Utah. And this is an ad admission directly from Brigham Young. He says, I am called rich and consider myself worth $250,000. It's probably a lowball uh, estimate. $250,000 in 1851. Uh, would be equivalent to $8 million in 2020. So even by his own admission, he was rich. Uh, but no dollar of it was ever paid me by the church. Not true. He got a lot of money from the church <laughs> uh, and from the tithing money. And he, he chose how to invest it in the territory and into uh, at least 137 businesses. Uh, but he says, I'm not paid by the church, nor for any service as a minister of the everlasting gospel, because that would be priestcraft, right? That's condemned in the temple. Okay, uh, the prophet Brigham Young's philosophy here on uh, wealth, 1862 uh, speech. If you wish to obtain wealth, power, glory, excellency, and exaltation of every kind, be for God and truth, and he will give to you more than your hearts can conceive of. Uh, well, that was certainly true of Brigham Young. Okay, a statement by Brigham Young's 19th wife, Anne Eliza Young. She said that her husband's dinner table received many delicacies which were not served to the general multitude. So... Lots of uh, delicacies on Brigham Young's dinner table. Okay, so another statement by Anne Eliza Young uh, in her book, Wife Number 19. She's pictured above. Uh, Brigham Young acquired enormous property of the value of several millions of dollars and was now the owner of at least $8 million in property. That's a lot of money back in Brigham Young's time. Uh, it's equivalent to $173 million in 2020. So if he was really worth that much, he was very, very wealthy. Uh, I was sufficiently informed to allege that his income was at least $40,000 a month. So $40,000 a month would be $865,000 a month in 2020. So she may be overestimating, but uh, if it's anywhere near that, Brigham Young was a very wealthy man. All right, so we continue with the same account here. Uh, she says that Brigham Young stated that according to his best knowledge, information, and belief, that all of his property taken together does not exceed in value the sum of $600,000. So that was another admission by Brigham Young. He says his property is worth about $600,000, which would be $13 million in 2020. That's according to his own admission. 
uh, and that his gross income from all of his property and every source does not exceed $6,000 a month. Uh, well, in 2020, that'd still be $130,000 of income per month. So, you know, I, a lot of people would be very happy <laughs> nowadays with that kind of an income. Okay, a statement in M.R. Werner's book, Brigham Young, 1925. A uh, very good biography on Brigham Young. It says in there, It was frequently assumed during his lifetime that Brigham Young profited tremendously himself by the wealth of the church, and the implication was that he was therefore a fraud. Okay, Werner continues, it is true that when he died, he left to his 17 surviving wives and 44 surviving children a fortune of about $2 million, which would be $48.6 million in 2020. His policies were profitable to him personally. He gathered his own wealth by personally dealing in cattle and agriculture. Okay, and according to John G. Turner in the uh, 1870 U.S. Census, Young reported $2 million in assets, which is about $40 million in 2020 in assets. Uh, also in the 1870 Census, he reported an annual income of $100,000, uh, which, would, which would be $2 million in 2020. Uh, so we're going to get all these different estimates, different, different research, different census and things. <clears throat> uh, of course, John G. Turner is a very good Mormon historian, uh, professor at George Mason University. He's pictured above here. We're going to be, be quoting a lot out of his book, uh, Brigham Young, the Pioneer Prophet, uh, which came out in 2012, which uh, is an excellent book that everybody should read. Okay, a few statements here in Frank Cannon and George Knapp's book. Brigham Young and his Mormon Empire, 1913. Uh, they say, whosoever is church emperor for the time being has absolute and irresponsible control of this vast supply of liquid wealth. Now in 1913, amounting to not less than $4 million per year. So this is after Brigham Young's death, uh, but it gives you an idea. In 1913, uh, they were making about $4 million per year in the church, which would be $105 million in 2020, uh, with yet other millions of accumulations. Okay, so in the same account here, uh, during the reign of Brigham, while tithes were unquestionably used to support church officials and even on occasion to enable them to build personal fortunes, uh, certainly true of uh, Brigham Young and some others. Uh, the general management of this fund was good. So th they kind of liked uh, Brigham Young's management of the, of the territory and the state. Okay, so uh, Cannon and Knapp continue. Brigham Young had undisputed charge of the tithing fund, which must have amounted to nearly a million dollars a year or $24.3 million a year in 2020, uh, by the time of his death, he gave no accounting of his vast income. So that was another thing. Brigham Young didn't keep very good records. <laughs> so when they were trying to figure out his estate after he died, they had a heck of a time figuring out uh, what all of his assets were in his, in his own name, in the church's name, et cetera. He, he kept bad records. Okay, so uh, Cannon and Knapp uh, give their estimate about what Brigham Young was worth. Uh, they say that Brigham left a fortune well above $2 million, uh, which would be $48.6 million in 2020. Uh, potentially, it was worth tens of millions of dollars, Brigham Young's fortune. Potentially worth tens of millions of dollars, which would mean that he was worth... $243 million and up in 2020. So that's their estimate. Okay, another statement from Werner. Uh, Brigham Young gave himself concessions in lumber from the canyons, and he worked those concessions. We're going to see those businesses later on in the, in the presentation. 
Uh, in the eyes of his followers, he was not only a king, but a prophet. Okay, another account by Mrs. C.V. Waite, uh, the Mormon prophet and his harem, talking about Brigham Young. This came out in uh, 1866. Uh, Brigham Young receives a large revenue derived from legislative gifts. He controlled the legislature, so <laughs> he just granted himself these gifts. Uh, or these concessions, uh, they were in the shape of timber canyons, which we already talked about, herding grounds for cattle, ferries, and other franchises. It is not strange that his worldly store should be constantly and largely augmented. Okay, so in the same account here. Uh, Brigham Young boasts that he takes no thought how to make money or get rich, and yet the riches constantly flow to him. He has said that he can drop dollar for dollar with any monarch in Europe, uh, pictured above. He looks after the Lord's interests and the Lord looks after his interests. Okay, some more information about what uh, companies Brigham Young was involved in. Same account here uh, by Weight. All property left by any deceased person went into the Perpetual Immigration Fund of which Brigham Young was president and custodian. So that's interesting. Anytime anybody died, all their property, their whole estate went into the Perpetual Immigration Fund to get more Mormons, I guess, into Utah, uh, of which Brigham Young had uh, total control of. Brigham Young also had the exclusive right uh, uh, to the Kansas Prairie, the Lone Rock Valley, the Rush Valley, and the Cache Valley herd grounds. So herding cattle, I guess, and maybe other animals, uh, maybe sheep, I'm not sure. Uh, Cache Valley was the richest and most productive valley in the territory. Uh, the legislature gave Brigham Young the exclusive rights to all of these herd grounds. Okay, some other businesses that Brigham Young controlled. Uh, same, account, same book here. Brigham had the exclusive right to establish a ferry over the Bear River. Brigham also had the exclusive right to, con to control the road and coal beds in Coal Canyon, San Pete County. Brigham also had a toll road called Tooele Road. So these are a couple of his businesses. Okay, so the same book here. Uh, they say from the European mission alone, over $500,000 of British tithing or gold has found its way into the pockets of Brigham Young. Uh, all the tithing from the European mission there, uh, $500,000, uh, which would be $8.8 .8 million in 2020, found its way into the pockets of Brigham Young because he controlled the tithing. Uh, pictured above is some of the perks and freebies of the modern day First Presidency and Twelve Apostles. Uh, they get very good health care, everything covered uh, by the church. They get first class travel on airplanes, etc. Uh, BYU tuition is free for any of their dependents, any of their children. If they want to go, go to BYU, they get to go for free. Uh, a lot of them have second homes. They have book promotions. They can get royalties from books. Uh, they can get event tickets, etc., etc. Okay, a statement here by Irving Wallace in his book, The 27th Wife, 1961, the story of Ann Eliza Young. I think she was the 19th wife. Not sure why he got that messed up. Uh, but, they, but he says, uh, Brigham Young is the owner of vast wealth, amounting to several millions of dollars and is in the monthly receipt of an income therefrom of not less than $40,000. Monthly, monthly income of $40,000 a month, which would be $865,000 in 2020. Uh, not too shabby. All right, so how much was Brigham Young worth? Uh, well, D. Michael Quinn gives us the following information in his book. It's probably one of the more reliable estimates. Uh, his book is The Mormon Hierarchy, Wealth, and Corporate Power, 2017. We're going we're gonna to show quite a bit of information from this book later on. But he says that Brigham Young's death year value, 1877, his death year value was $1.6 million. 
Uh, that is the formal appraisal of his estate. This would be $39 million in 2020. So if that really is accurate, that's not too shabby. I'll, I'll take $39 million. Uh, John D. Lee, in his book, Mormonism Unveiled, 1891, had the following estimates. He has left his family well provided for, apportioning property to each member. His estate is valued from six to seven millions of dollars, which would be 146 million to 170 million in 2020. So that is a lot higher estimate. Uh, so, so, you know, we don't know for sure. We know that Brigham Young had a lot of potential basically running the entire state, uh, being in charge of all the tithing and uh, all the tithing money. We know that he had vast opportunities and potential for earning income. And like I said, he owned and ran over 137 businesses. Okay, statement here by Richard Baines in his book, One Nation Under Gods, 2002. Brigham Young had a beautiful and spacious beehive house built. Uh, that's the one pictured on the, on the left here. Uh, complete with separate rooms for each wife. It allowed for ample living space as well as privacy when Young visited his women or his wives. Brigham Young also had his lion house, which is pictured on the right, a supplemental home for his large family. And that had a lot of, uh, that was a, the lion house was very long and had a lot of rooms in it for, for all of his wives. I think he had around 55 wives. And here's another look or a picture here of the lion house and the beehive house. So pretty nice little compound he had in there. All right, here's another angle on the Lion House. It goes in 10 rooms deep, two stories high, and it's got two different sides. So that's, uh, what, 40, at least 40 rooms on the two stories. And it looks like there might be some rooms in the basement as well. Okay, we'll go over some statements by TBH Stenhouse in the Rocky Mountain Saints book. 1878, just one year after uh, Brigham Young died. Brigham Young has himself become immensely rich, having control of the tithing and possessing unlimited credit. He has added house to house and field to field. Okay, Stenhouse continues. As trustee and trust, Brigham Young renders no account of the funds that come into his hands. And what accounts there are were, were not kept uh, very well. <laughs> uh, the building of the Union Pacific Railroad was said to have yielded him about a quarter of a million dollars, uh, which would be six million dollars in 2020. So as you probably know, the railroad business uh, could be extremely lucrative. And Brigham Young was involved in a number of different railroads, including the Union Pacific. Okay, same account here. Uh, the Utah Central Railroad brought him also a very large sum of money. There is probably not a county in Utah where Brigham has not some valuable property. So here we have a picture above, Utah Central. Uh, that looks like a pretty modern train. Uh, I think it became part of the Union Pacific Railroad, but this looks like a fairly modern train that still has the name... Uh, Utah Central on it. Okay, another little tidbit from Stenhouse. Uh, very good source uh, for all this kind of stuff. The Rocky Mountain Saints book, 1878. Brigham Young possesses $600,000 of Utah Central Railroad bonds, uh, which would be about $13.7 million in 2020, just in one of his holdings, one of his railroads. So that's pretty impressive. Okay, some more property that Brigham uh, had. Uh, Brigham took up great tracts of land and the legislature, which was controlled by Brigham, gave him grants of all that he coveted. All the 20th Ward bench to the north of the city and lying east of his premises was given to him. So I'm not sure how big of a, an area that was. Uh, sounds like quite a bit of property. Okay, another little tidbit here. Uh, there were rumors that Brigham was the third largest depositor in the Bank of England. 
I kind of doubt it. <laughs> Third largest, I kind of doubt it. There's some big money in the Bank of England. Uh, that's pictured above. Uh, one author said that Brigham had told him that he had several millions of dollars deposited there. Maybe. Uh, you know, because everywhere the Saints went, they were kicked out. So maybe Brigham wanted to have some money kind of in a neutral location, a neutral bank, uh, you know, in case they got kicked out of Salt Lake, uh, you know, which they very, very well could have happened, but didn't. Okay, uh, same account here. Some years later in 1871, a New York journalist visiting the prophet Brigham Young referred to the rumor about Brigham having a deposit of $17 million in the Bank of England. $17 million would be $367 million in 2020, so a really large sum of money. <laughs> Brigham is said to have regretted that it was untrue and that he had not a dollar outside of Utah. So who are we to believe? Uh, again, uh, the Bank of England here pictured uh, on the right-hand side this is, uh, you know, in the 1870s. Okay, back to John G. Turner's book. Uh, most of Brigham Young's wealth rested in real estate, kind of like in this fancy uh, house, the Gardo house that he built for Amelia, his favorite wife. Nice looking house. As trustee and trust for the church, Young also oversaw a further vast array of enterprises and held much of the church's property in his own name. All right, another statement uh, in Turner's book here. Uh, Young lived in the commodious Beehive House mansion with three parlors containing space for family celebrations and social gatherings, decorated tastefully enough to impress the politicians and journalists who visited Young in Utah. And, of course, uh, this is one of the parlors in the Beehive House. Uh, pretty nice a place to, uh, to entertain politicians and journalists. All right, so let's go to some of the things, some of the items that Brigham Young owned. Again, this is research done by John G. Turner. Uh, one thing was a carriage of the best material and workmanship of the latest best, most fashionable, and approved style. Maybe something uh, like pictured above. Not sure. This is, you know, a carriage from that, that time period. All right. Uh, Brigham Young also owns some nice carpets, maybe kind of like pictured here in this parlor in the Beehive House. Uh, but he got carpeting made of a good-sized, well-twisted thread made of long stapled coarsish good wool. So some nice fancy carpets. All right, Brigham Young also had a nice set of opera glasses. I'm not sure where he went to the opera. Uh, nicely cased in roan calf instead of patent leather. So I guess roan calf was a better kind of leather, maybe for the case for it. And this may be what the uh, opera glasses look like. They're, they're from that time period. And Brigham Young also owned a dozen pairs of the best French kid gents gloves made of goat skin, not sheepskin. So I guess goat skin gloves uh, were better and nicer than sheepskin gloves. And Brigham Young also owned a grand piano. That's kind of a nice piece of furniture. And Turner continues, uh, such acquisitions announced young status as a gentleman of means, refinement, and status. Kind of like pictured above. And when Brigham Young showed fellow church leaders his pianos, furniture, and other domestic acquisitions, he exhibited a pride quite understandable given his modest roots. He kind of uh, was raised in uh, poverty, like a lot of people at this time. Okay, same book. Uh, Brigham Young had obtained choice real estate holdings and the ability to conduct nationwide business through church representatives in St. Louis and the East. And this picture above, I, I think, is again his St. George house as it currently looks. Uh, of course, it's all fixed up and painted now. 
Okay, Turner continues. The legislature had granted Young a number of concessions involving timber, herding, and water rights all on the public domain. And we're going to go over what those businesses were specifically. By the early 1860s, Brigham Young also managed a vast array of enterprises, including farms, mills, a cotton factory, and a lumber yard. So, and one of his enterprises was ZCMI, as pictured above. Uh, he had quite a bit of stock in ZCMI. Wholesale dry goods, leather and shoe uh, bindings. Is that bindings? Uh, groceries, hardware, stoves, tinware, etc. Okay, uh, Turner continues. Brigham Young listed nearly 200 employees in the early 1860s and through the wages of his workers and his support of his family, he provided for over 1,000 individuals. So he was, he was a big deal. Uh, a lot of employees. Okay, William A. Lynn uh, provides an estimate of Brigham Young's wealth uh, in his book, The Story of the Mormons, 1901. Uh, Young was a successful accumulator of property for his own use. His estate at his death was valued at between $2 million and $3 million, which would be $48.6 million to $73 million in 2020. So, nice chunk of change. All right, so uh, William A. Lynn talks about this article in the Salt Lake Tribune, which came out uh, June 25, 1879. Uh, this was two years after the death of Brigham Young. Uh, the writer in the Salt Lake Tribune article asserted that Young had secured in Utah from the tithing $13 million, which would be $316 million in 2020. Uh, it also asserted that Brigham Young squandered about $9 million on his family, which is about $218 million squandered. <laughs> And he left the rest to be fought for by his heirs and assigns. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, there was a big uh, battle and some lawsuits on where the, uh, the money in Brigham Young's estate would go, which wives it went to, which children, etc. Okay, Lynn continues as trustee and trust for the church. Brigham Young had control of all the church property and income practically without responsibility or oversight. Uh, yep, indeed, he, he was running a theocracy, had control both over the church and the state. Okay, another interesting statement by the prophet Brigham Young, uh, 1873 speech. Uh, he says, I made a statement yesterday which I can make again with all propriety, that in my judgment it would take more than I have got to pay my back tithing. Strange statement. Why, why was he not paying his back tithing? <laughs> and I have got as much probably as any man in the church. It's not probably, it's definitely. <laughs> he had more money than anybody in the church. 137 businesses. All right, another statement by the prophet Brigham Young. I have about as many buildings as anyone in this territory. So he kind of liked to brag about all the buildings he had. And another statement by the prophet Brigham Young, 1859. I have had a great deal given to me by the members of the church. So he kind of contradicts himself with other statements. All right, a statement uh, in D. Michael Quinn's book, The Mormon Hierarchy, Wealth, and Corporate Power, 2017. Good book he put out just a couple years ago, giving uh, all this kind of information. Uh, he says, five men in early Utah had management roles in 95 to 150 enterprises while serving in the hierarchy. At the top of the list was Brigham Young. And I've made slides for all these businesses uh, for Brigham Young. And like I said, he was managing 137 different businesses. And George Q. Cannon uh, in 1891 had the following to say, 
Uh, he was in the first presidency. When there was a surplus of church funds, it was customary to invest them that they might accumulate. And in some cases, the title was in the name of Brigham Young. Yeah, in a lot of the cases. Okay, so the church historian Leonard J. Arrington uh, put out an interesting article in the Pacific Historical Review in 1952. Uh, Arrington is pictured above. Uh, the article is entitled The Settlement of the Brigham Young Estate. And, and there's, a, there's one statement in there that says, Brigham Young and other church authorities, when need required it, drew on the tithing resources of the church and at a later date repaid part or all of the obligation in money, property, or services. So I, if they were church services, then that's priestcraft. <laughs> All right, Arrington continues, uh, no interest seems to have been paid for the use of these funds. So it's just free money. It's like having, having your own bank and not having to pay interest on any of the money. Free money, and uh, here's Arrington pictured uh, again uh, as a little bit older man. Okay, Arrington uh, again here in the same article. Uh, this ability to draw almost at will on church as well as his own funds was a great advantage to Brigham Young and was certainly one of the reasons for his worldly success. So he's being fairly honest in this article. And Arrington continues, while Brigham Young was probably the largest borrower of funds from the trustee and trust, he was certainly not the only one. Okay, the Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of Utah, Orlando W. Powers, uh, in the Reed Smoot case, gave us some information in 1904. Uh, he said, after the Liberal Party had secured control of the city of Salt Lake, I procured an investigation to be made of the city records, which had been written up by the Mormon city recorders from the earliest time. And uh, pictured above is, is a modern, uh, modern Supreme Court of Utah. Okay, so Orlando Powers uh, continues. The leading officials of the church seem to have had access to the city's treasury. On one occasion, Brigham Young borrowed from the city of Salt Lake $10,000, which would be $311,000 in 2020, so quite a bit of money. Okay, Orlando Powers continues. In 1873, he, Brigham Young, borrowed $14,000 from, from the city. So he, he controlled all the tithing money in the church, but he also controlled all the money coming into the city. And in 1873, he just decided to borrow $14,000 from the city, which would be $302,000 in 2020. Uh, the records show that other leading church officials at times also borrowed from the city. Okay, another account here from the Associate Justice of the Second Judicial District, John Cradlebaugh. Uh, Utah and the Mormons, a speech delivered in the House of Representatives in 1863, uh, which showed up in the Congressional Globe. He said, Cradlebaugh says, Brigham himself is king, priest, lawgiver, and chief polygamist. He selects for himself the choicest spots of land and the territory, and they yield him their productions, none daring to interfere. And of course, uh, John Cradlebaugh is pictured above. Okay, uh, Cradlebaugh continues. Uh, the timber in the mountains for a great distance from Salt Lake City belongs to Brigham Young. And it is only by delivering each third load as he shall order that the gates are open and the citizens allowed to pass up City Creek Canyon to obtain it. So it sounds like uh, kind of as a tax, they had to give uh, every, third lower, every third load of uh, timber in the mountains uh, to Brigham Young. And uh, C.V. Waite also talks about this City Creek Canyon uh, lumber in uh, her book. It is estimated that Young's income from the City Creek Canyon alone is $10,000 per year. 
A lot of money, uh, which would be three hundred and eleven thousand dollars in twenty twenty. Uh, just from the just from the City Creek Canyon uh, timber. Okay, uh, back to Cradle Bow. Uh, the cattle on a thousand hills exhibit Brigham Young's brand. He fixes his pay. He pays himself. So a lot of cattle with the Brigham Young brand, whatever uh, that looked like. And I actually found uh, Brigham Young's brand for his cattle. <laughs> This was a page that had a lot, of, a lot of different brands in Utah. This is just part of the page. Uh, but you see the red arrow there. Brigham Young's brand was just simply a Y, uh, kind of like the uh, BYU uh, sports team logo. Okay, the Journal of L. John Nuttall, April 10, 1878 entry, had a list of some of Brigham Young's assets. So this is pretty interesting. So we got the, the name of the asset, the value in 1878, uh, the value in 2020 in columns. We won't go through all of these. Let's just go through the, like, the biggest ones. So the Amelia House or the Gardo House and land, a value of $100,000 in 1878, worth $2.7 million in 2020. Uh, Brigham Young's Theater, Salt Lake Theater, we've talked about, was worth $125,000 in 1878, $3.3 million in 2020. Uh, let's see, what else? Salt Lake City gas stock, $80,000 value in 1878 and now worth $2.1 million. $118,000 in ZCMI stock, that'd be worth $3.1 million today. Provo factory stock, $50,000. Uh, which would be 1.3 million today. City railroad stock, $55,000, 1.5 million today. Washington factory notes, $60,000 uh, worth, uh, 1.6 million today. So if you add all these up, and this is not everything uh, that Brigham Young owned, just some of his assets. Uh, if you add all these up, it's about $700,000 in 1878 and about 18.5 million in 2020, so uh, a lot of assets. Okay, another uh, statement in Bancroft's History of Utah. Perhaps the most remarkable feature in the proceedings of the assembly is the liberality with which valuable timber and pasture lands and water privileges were granted to favored individuals, you know, and especially Brigham Young. Okay, so Bancroft continues uh, by act of December 9, 1850, the control of City Creek in the canyon was granted to Brigham Young, who was required to pay, therefore, the sum of $500, uh, which is nothing compared to how much he was making uh, on the timber in that canyon. And Bancroft uh, also said that Brigham Young was certainly a millionaire. Okay, so Bancroft points attention uh, to some internal revenue office uh, income of Brigham Young, uh, now called the IRS. <laughs> His total income for 1870 is stated at 25500 which is 522000 in 2020. In 1871, it was stated at 111680 uh, which would be $2.4 million in 2020. And in 1872 is at 39,952, which would be 864,000 in 2020. Uh, so you know that's year, yearly income. Okay, a statement by Stanley P. Hershon in his book, The Lion of the Lord, 1969. In Utah, he Brigham Young longed for more wives, additional converts, and greater power. In God's and his church's name, he made the Great Basin his private possession. Okay, uh, Hershon continues. Within months of his migrations to Utah, $1,000 in debt, Brigham Young, by his own admission, was rich. And we've, we've gone over those, those statements uh, that Brigham Young has admitted. All right, uh, Hershon quotes from Brigham Young. Uh, Brigham Young said, before I had been one year in this place in Utah, 
Uh, he, Brigham Young, bragged in 1850 that the wealthiest man who came from the mines, Father Rhodes, with $17,000, could not buy the possessions that I, Brigham Young, had made in one year. So Brigham Young bragging that he's, he's making a lot of money. Okay, so Hershon continues. Uh, during the 1860s, the profit's personal income averaged $32,000 a year. That'd be $542,000 a year in 2020. Uh, in the 1870 census, he declared personal property worth $102,000. That'd be $2 million in 2020. And here's the big one. He claimed real estate valued at $1,010,600, which would be $20.7 million in 2020. Uh, so yeah, Brigham Young had a lot of real estate. Uh, by this account, over a million dollars worth uh, in the 1870 census. And Brigham Young would ask members of the church uh, who were making a lot of money or who were wealthy to send him presents or send him uh, <laughs> basically money. Here, here's a case of this uh, Brigham Young letter to Samuel Brannan, uh, Journal History of the Church, 1849. Brigham Young wants you, Samuel Brannan, to send him a present of $20,000 in gold dust. Uh, $20,000 in gold dust is $622,000 in 2020 uh, to help Brigham Young with his labors. So, <laughs> interesting request. All right, and D. Michael Quinn, uh, in his book, uh, The Mormon Hierarchy, Wealth, and Corporate Power, uh, broke down Brigham Young's personal income by year. So I'm not sure where he got this from. <clears throat> it's probably one of the more accurate uh, estimates or representations of Brigham Young's income by year. You can kind of just go ahead and look through this. Uh, I'm not going to read all of it here. <clears throat> um, the Some of the bigger ones, he made uh, 28524 in 1868 which would be 555,000 in 2020. Uh, 1870, he made $111,000, which would be 2.3 million in 2020. 1871, $39,532, personal, personal income for the year, which would be 855,000 in 2020. So you add all these up, you know, it's multi-millions of dollars. And uh, Quinn talks about his income in 1870 and, and why it went up so much. He says, uh, Brigham Young's massive increase in personal income in 1870 was due to his lucrative contracts with the Union Pacific Railroad, which he defined as personal income. So like I said before, you can make a shit ton of money in the railroad industry uh, also in the oil industry, also in uh, banking. But uh, yeah, Brigham Young uh, made a lot of money in the railroads. All right, so uh, again, Stenhouse uh, talks about some of the sources for his uh, income. He says, Brigham Young has money and plenty of it. Of his income from his numerous and vast estates, his theater, the cooperative business, which was ZCMI as pictured above, his railroad bonds, his mills, his farms, and his rents in the city and from all sources. And uh, Stenhouse also lists the uh, personal income by year from 1867 to 1872 uh, for Brigham Young. Uh, the Internal Revenue Office at Washington has on record the following statement. So. Similar to the numbers uh, by Quinn, we can go ahead and uh, read through this if you want. Just pause it. Okay, so we've finally gotten to the list of all of the uh, businesses and enterprises that Brigham Young was involved in. And this comes from uh, D. Michael Quinn's book, uh, Wealth and Corporate Power, the Mormon Hierarchy. He lists them all. Like I've said, there's 137 of them here. And uh, Brigham Young was either a partner or president or an owner of all the uh, businesses listed on this slide 
and I have like five or six of these slides. I'm not going to go through all of these. You can pause this and look through this uh, in more detail if you want to. Uh, but, you know, there's herd grounds, there's lumber companies, there's canals, there's tanneries, uh, there's banks, uh, probably the Bank of Deseret and Brigham Young's bank that probably brought him in a lot of money, blacksmith, carpentry, fact cotton factories, <clears throat> uh, even a restaurant, a farm, a grist mill, uh, etc. Okay, the next slide, a list of companies Brigham Young was involved in. He was either partner, owner, or proprietor of all these uh, businesses listed on here. Uh, most of the ones on this list, he was owner. Uh, cattle and herds, uh, kilns, lumber, uh, maps, molasses, factories, paint, paper, replastering, pottery, real estate, Shoes, silk, uh, stables, tanneries, uh, even ta even taverns uh, that served alcohol, a woolen factory, um, mills, warehouses, etc. Okay, the next slide of uh, companies Brigham Young was involved in. Uh, he was either partner, owner, president, director, or trustee of all the ones on this slide. Uh, you can pause this and look through all these if you want. But he had a slaughterhouse, a stone cutting yard, <laughs> machine shop, wood shop, a uh, real estate company, a herd company, water supply, uh, banking and financing with the Deseret Currency Association, iron company, canal company, manufacturing, merchandising, the Deseret Mint, another kind of bank, the Deseret National Bank, paper company, a merchandising company, a tannery, a telegraph company, a school, a woolen mills, and a toll road. Okay, the next slide of uh, companies Brigham Young was involved in. He was either partner, owner, president, or director of all the ones on this slide. Uh, merchandising, uh, grain mills, farms, livestock, real estate, uh, food company, the Globe Saloon, which served alcohol, a coal company, a water supply company, a grain milling company, cotton factory, a banking institution, uh, the Howard Distillery, which made uh, hard alcohol, an irrigation company, a railroad, a uh, livestock company, uh, agriculture, a bakery, a flour mill, and a water transport company, a steamboat. So the list just goes on and on. Okay, another slide of all of his companies uh, where he was partner, owner, president, director, trustee, or stockholder in all these. So we got a toll bridge, we got a sawmill, a lumber company, we got an insurance company, a water supply company, cotton factory, a uh, banking fund, a, another livestock company, a merchandising company, an irrigation company, a road building company textile company, a machine shop, uh, another herd company, a couple of, of uh, different railroads, a uh, hotel, the Salt Lake Theater, which is was a pretty valuable uh, property, entertainment company, a coal company, a couple of real estate companies, and a social hall and entertainment company. So list goes on. Okay, I think this is the last slide. Uh, list of companies Brigham Young was involved in. Uh, all these, he was either a partner, an owner, a president, or a director. We have a paper mill company, a water transport company, a textile company, a grain milling company, a toll road, a uh, school, uh, four different railroads, Union Pacific Railroad, Utah Central Railroad, Utah Southern Railroad, Utah Western Railway. Uh, he probably made a fortune on those. Uh, an entertainment company, a woolen mills, a toll bridge, a livestock company, an agricultural equipment company, another distillery, Young and Little, uh, where they made alcohol. You could make a ton of money uh, selling alcohol in these days. That was a very good business to be in. Grain milling, merchandising, tannery, a fish company, uh, ZCMI, Zions Cooperative Mercantile Institution, which was like a department store. Uh, Zions Cooperative Rio Virgin Manufacturing Company, a textile company, uh, which Brigham Young had $60,000 in stock in in 1877, uh, which would be $1.46 million in 2020. 
And, of course, Zion's Bank. He was the president. All right, so where did all this information come from uh, for the companies Brigham Young was involved in? Uh, well, they came from a very good source and one of the best Mormon researchers out there, D. Michael Quinn. This book only come, came out uh, a couple years ago. Uh, so all this information uh, comes from Quinn's book, The Mormon Hierarchy, Wealth, and Corporate Power, Appendix 5, uh, General Authorities in Business Before 1933. Okay, a few more slides here, and then we are done. Uh, this one is from the church historian Leonard J. Arrington in his book, Brigham Young, American Moses, 1985. Uh, he says Brigham Young owned a sizable acreage of land in the Red Butte area east of the city from which the church had planned to quarry red sandstone for the Salt Lake Temple. So uh, the Salt Lake Temple originally had a sandstone foundation. Not a good idea. <laughs> sandstone is not a very strong rock. But for some reason, they originally decided to make the, the foundation out of sandstone then they noticed it was starting to wear and crack and disintegrate. So they had to replace the entire foundation uh, with granite, uh, which they did. And then they built uh, on top of that uh, all, all in granite. Okay, so let's go to D. Michael Quinn's uh, dissertation, The Mormon Hierarchy, 1832 to 1932, an American Elite. The Yale PhD dissertation in May 1976. Uh, of course, then he did his uh, three volumes on the Mo on the uh, Mormon hierarchy, uh, which I highly recommend. A lot of good information in those three volumes. But it all started out here with his dissertation uh, at Yale in 1976. So he says, a state executor, George Q. Cannon, recorded in his journal that members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles were critical of Brigham Young's liberal use of church funds even though some of that use may have been for church projects. So even some of the 12 were critical of Brigham Young for uh, taking so much money out of church funds. Okay, so George Q. Cannon continues. Uh, of course, he's an apostle and in the first presidency. Uh, he says, some of my brethren, as I have since learned since the death of President Brigham Young, did have feelings concerning his course. They did not approve of it and felt opposed, and yet they dared not exhibit their feelings to him. He ruled with such a strong and stiff hand, and indeed he did. And then a statement from Quinn. Uh, in a few words, the feelings seem to be that Brigham Young transcended the bounds of the authority which he legitimately held. And uh, the statement by Quinn continues, it is felt that the funds of the church have been used with a freedom not warranted by the authority which Brigham Young held. All right, so that's going to do it for this video. It should be very apparent to you after watching all of this and listening to me that Brigham Young did indeed become rich, and he did become rich very quickly. Uh, he had a ton of potential uh, to make money, a, a ton of potential to start up all these businesses, 137 different businesses, which he either owned or he ran or he was a director or he was president. And so he, he had a, a ton of opportunity for making a ton of money, probably a fairly conservative estimate of how much Brigham Young was worth at the time of his death is two to three million dollars. I would say that's pretty conservative. It could have been a lot more. Uh, some people uh, put that at you know eight, nine, ten million dollars, and even higher. Uh, but if he was worth about uh, two to three million dollars at the time of his death, uh, that means in 2020 that he would have been worth about 49 million to 73 million dollars. Uh, in 2020. So not too shabby, uh, you know, not a billionaire, uh, but certainly $50 million today is nothing to sneeze at. <clears throat> uh, but that's going to do it for this video. And I thank you for watching. 
the Brigham Young Becomes Rich video.